When I was a young student living in Rome, my friends and I used to go on Sundays to visit the tombs of the martyrs and the apostles. We would enter the cavern cut into the rock, so full of burial sites that it was like we were living out the prophetic saying, may they descend alive to the inferno. The rarefied light from above ground diminished the darkness a little. But the glow was so dim that it seemed to be coming from a narrow shaft rather than a skylight. We moved forward slowly, one step after another, completely enshrouded by the darkness. This suggestive description of the Roman catacombs was written at the turn of the fourth century by the great church patriarch, Saint Jerome. In this account, we can already discern a certain frame of mind that was to develop around the origins of Christianity, regarded as a fascinating and mysterious subject imbued with the drama of persecutions and surrounded by an obscure and violent atmosphere. While these ideas did in some sense reflect a historical reality, they also gave rise to a series of commonplaces that were to reach their peak at the end of the last century. The phenomenon of the persecution certainly represented one of the most pressing and emotive problems for early Christianity, and the worship of the martyrs constituted an irreplaceable cardinal point in the popular devotion of the original church. It also, however, served as a strong emotional cause of mass conversion. By the third century, Ippolito of Rome, speaking of the subject, was already able to note everyone beholding the bloody end of the martyrs was filled with wonder and in great numbers inspired by their faith became themselves martyrs of God. Martyrdom however should not be understood only in its dramatic and bloody aspect but rather as a testimony. The suffering and death of a martyr are the manifestation of the power of the resurrection. For in martyrdom, Christ suffers and conquers death. Just as the concept of martyrdom needs to be modified, so it is generally better to overturn the idea of the early church as being forever buffeted and traversed by agonies and difficulties, and dwell instead on the positive elements that animated and strengthened the faith of the nascent church. If we travel with a less medieval spirit through those same meandering ways of the catacombs, the flickering light of our lanterns will unexpectedly illuminate the decorations in the funeral chambers. Their motif barely essential in form, yet extremely profound in content. Their art is simple, as simple, immediate, and moving as the conversion of the first century Christians who used the burial chambers of the catacombs as if they were dormitories, blessed resting places whilst they awaited paradise. The vaults and walls of the cubicles are decked out in representations of a simple and peaceful paradise made up of peacocks, birds in flight, fountains, a positive world where no upheavals would impair even momentarily the condition of beatified peace. The themes of paradise on the wall frescoes are also to be found on the artwork of the sarcophaguses, depicting in full the details of agrarian life in allusion to the blessed existence of these deceased Christians who appear in these bucolic contexts symbolically represented as worshipers and shepherds.
Around the middle of the third century, the decoration of the sarcophaguses underwent a significant change. The themes that were dear to pagan mythology were abandoned, and new images that sought to express the new spirituality disseminated by the Christian religion found room. Such imagery is to be seen on the sarcophagus of the Via Solaria, where scenes from the life of the Catechism alternate in harmonious progression with images of the Good Shepherd at prayer. The praying figure captures the likeness of the deceased in an expressive mood, hands outstretched in an attitude of prayer, an attitude identified in the precious testimony of Tertullian, the great father of the African church who, in the second century, drew a splendid parallel in which he compared the flight of birds whose wings stretch out in the form of the cross to the manner in which men pray. The attitude of the man at prayer, however, is meant as more than a request for divine intervention. Rather, it is a beatified state a continuous prayer which for the Christian begins with baptism and continues even after death in an unending hymn of glory, as in the words of Paul, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. The deceased supplicant is accompanied by that other important figure so often represented in the decorations of Paleo-Christian sarcophaguses, the Good Shepherd. Occasionally, this Christian symbol par excellence occurs in a context which has an undeniably pagan ascendancy, but in Christian art, the figure of the Good Shepherd is one of the fundamental compass points in the story of salvation. On a sarcophagus from the end of the 4th century, from the site at St. Lawrence outside the walls, the Savior is portrayed in the center of a peculiar apostolic college represented as a flock. This notion recalls the famous 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The image of the Good Shepherd, enriched and strengthened through a literature entirely inspired by the Gospel parables and the 23rd Psalm, soon became the symbol of salvation and for this reason may sometimes appear in isolation on the front of sarcophaguses and sometimes duplicated on the sides. In some exceptional cases, the figure is made to resemble the mythical Orpheus, almost as if the intention were to provide a pictorial translation of a specific excerpt from the great church father Eusebius de Caesarea. If Orpheus could sue the wild beasts with his lyre, nay, bewitch the very oaks with the charm of his notes, the all-powerful word of God did more. To heal the human mind, he created an instrument with his own hands, the nature of man. And with this instrument, he played an enchanting music by which he charmed and soothed the customs of the barbarians and the pagans, healing the brutal and savage instincts of their hearts with the physic of the celestial doctrine. By the end of the third century, the symbolic images were already being accompanied by more complex subjects, like the banquet scene where the table is replete with bread and fish. Seated around it is a group intent on partaking of this mystic fare. These scenes have a very complex significance. If, on the one hand, they allude to the miracle of the bread and fishes, on the other, they can also be understood as referring to the refrigerium, 
The meal consumed in honor of the deceased, celebrating the anniversary of their death. Obviously, however, the most exalted significance of the figurative scene is to be found in connection with the Eucharist. To this category belongs one of the elaborate and important monuments of Paleo-Christian funeral sculpture. The Sarcophagus of Jonah. A series of stories inspired by the Bible are arranged on two levels, in which the story of Jonah virtually explodes upon the scene, inundating the entire space with the cycle of events that befell the prophet. The Jonah story must have struck the popular imagination for the abundance of prodigies therein. The unleashing and the calming of the ocean storm, the whale that swallows the prophet keeping him intact for three days, the sudden growth and drying up of the castor plant. Nor should it be forgotten that Jonah is the one prophet with whom Christ compares himself. His story prefigures the Passio Christi with the prayers of the just man persecuted, the three days and three nights of burial, the resurrection. This is why among the scenes on the sarcophagus another famous and moving episode of resurrection makes an appearance that of Jesus' dearest friend, Lazarus. <laughs> 